Hey everyone, um, welcome to another video. Uh, I'm gonna do another artist video. Um, I haven't really done one except for the Boris Vallejo one, which didn't really go over all that well. <clears throat> I don't know if a lot of people know who Boris Vallejo is. Um, in, in this regard, I might also be uh, pulling up somebody who's a little too obscure for most people. However, his art is very iconic and you probably have seen it before although you don't know who the guy is um probably the most notable is uh the duran duran um rio album cover so we're talking about patrick nagal that's how i pronounce it like as in nepal nagal uh actually some people call it nagel and i think that's actually how you do pronounce it patrick nagel because it's n-a-g-e-l um, but I always call him Nagal, because it just sounds more artistic and more f uh, play, play, right? So, um, I, I'm just going to keep rec referring to him as Nagal, even though everybody's going to be like, it's actually Nagal. Um, Nagal town sounds too much like bagel to me, and I don't like the way that rolls off the tongue, so I like Nagal. It's very, it's more pretentious, and I like it. Um, so, that said, um, if you know the, rap, the Rio album cover, um, you'll know his art. I think he did a Aerosmith cover as well, or is Soriyama did the, Soriyama is another one I need to cover as well. Um, and uh, like Boris, like Soriyama, he, like myself, he's uh, an artist who uh, his basically he does girl art, or some people call it good girl art, some people call it bad girl art, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it, but his primary subject is always female, is always, you know, female. Uh, similar to what I do, similar to what Boris does. I mean, even though Boris does do male, you know, barbarians and other characters, primarily is known for being a, a doing his girl art. Um, and, and Soriyama, of course, doing the robot girl art. <clears throat> and most of my favorite artists are always artists that do girl art. It's just my favorite subject matter. Um, and Nagal has a very distinct, simplistic, yet still complicated art style. Um, and I think it goes very underappreciated. Um, I absolutely love it. I mean, I fell in love with his art uh, ever since. I don't think it was necessarily the Rio album cover. I think for me, it was going to the mall all the time, and there was a frame slash poster shop that was over by Hudson's in the Lakeside Mall. I think there's one in Oakland Mall too. Every mall seemed like they had one of these. You know, you go there and you get, you know, all the the Ensel Adams uh, photography uh, posters. You know, that was a big thing back in the '80s too, is to get your Ensel Adams, uh, uh, you know, poster and have it framed uh, with a nice fancy, you know, black uh, black, um, you know, like aluminum frame or like an anodized metal aluminum frame. Um, also. Uh, Nagal was a huge one. And if you went there, you would get those poster shops. They would sell, I guess they're prints, two posters and prints. I can't, I think it was just called the poster shop. I think that's what actually what the store was called. I can't remember. If anybody knows what that store was called, let me know. I'd have to do a little bit of research on it. But I remember it as being the poster shop, but I could be wrong. Um, and they sold, you know, they would, they would uh, shrink wrap the posters onto a big piece of cardboard. And you could flip through them and you could see that. You could buy them that way. You could buy them rolled. You could buy them um, already framed. You know, prof you know, uh, professionally framed. I think. I don't think they did framing there specifically. I think if you wanted something, fr I don't know. Um, I don't know this. I've done a little bit of framing in my life too. Worked at a couple of framing places, but I don't know if this place did the framing. I think they would order it. So if you came in and you said, "Hey, I wanted a print, uh, a, a Nagal print, a Nagel print." And I wanted it, um, you know, or poster. Usually it's 24 by 36, and I wanted a frame. A lot of times, I mean, that's a pretty standard size. So I'm assuming maybe they did have frames in, like they didn't, not, they didn't necessarily frame, but they had like a, a a table in the back, you know, and the and the different tools and stuff. It's pretty simple to just take a poster, take a, you know, that's standard size of 24 by 36, you know, just like my 24 by 36 frame up there. You know, pull out the, pull out the, whatever, either it's got the little tie, you know, little, little, uh, 
like all the different um can't remember the, what the words are off the top of my head. You said brads, the brads on. <laughs> um, you could sometimes you had the bendy brads, sometimes you had the screw brads, sometimes you had you just had a staple brad. Like if it was a wood frame, you could do a staple brad. Now with the metal frames, they usually had it was a little stick, a little flathead screwdriver, and you you would put the brad in the slot, and then you would turn it, and it would it would it would pull the brad down. Um, and then you could secure it in. So you'd usually put down either a piece of plexi or a piece of real glass. A lot of times with the cheaper frames, they're plexi, or it's not even plex. It's it's plexiglass. It's not even acrylic. Acrylic would be expensive, but this was acrylic. This is like thin. It might even just been regular transparent polystyrene, whatever it is. But let's just say plexiglass right? or or glass in the uh, frame first, and then you put the poster. Now, if you wanted to see. Framing shops would actually do mats, so you would actually cut a mat to it. But a lot of these times, it was part of the style to not have it matted, just to have it right butted right up against the, you know, flush with the metal frame. Most of the time, the frames were black. Sometimes they're red. Sometimes they're yellow. I mean, it's very 80s colors, depending on what you're doing. Um, but uh, you would, you would put the you'd poster down. You put a piece of corrugate. Um, sometimes two pieces of corrugate. Depending on how much you need, but most of the time it would fit, sorry, it would fit like a, um, a piece of plexi or glass, usually an eighth inch, eighth inch thick. Sometimes it was a sixteenth on the plexi if it was thin, crappy stuff like that. That's the sixteenth uh, piece, and then you throw the poster down. Now the thing was, in order to get this in there to look good, one thing you definitely wanted to do is you wanted to use electrostatic gloves where you wouldn't pick up dust. So you'd use like a white pair of electrostatic gloves. And you'd want to take a brush and you'd constantly be brushing inside of that glass. First you'd clean the glass. If it was glass, you'd use a glass cleaner, obviously. Let it dry. Um, and then you stick the poster down. And then you, you know, and hopefully you get all the little, and you flip it over and you realize, oh, shit, I got a little piece of flake. And you, it, it, framing is, a, is tedious. Um, I've done it twice in my life, two different stores. Um, and I, I'm not a big fan of I mean, I like it, but I don't like it all at the same time. But just putting posters and poster frames is pretty simple. I am pretty sure that's what they did. So I'm getting off course. But that store used to always have these Nagal print, Nagel prints all over the place. And I used to love that art. And I was like, who is that artist? And I'd walk in and ask the guy, hey, well, who's the artist that does those those white chicks? <laughs> oh, Patrick Nagal. Patrick Nagal. They're Nagel, meh. And then... Uh, I was, oh, okay. And I remember I went to Walden Books in that mall. It was on the corner uh, um, in the one section, like in the middle. And we said, Walden Books. And this is, I'm going to say, like, late 80s. And uh, I walked over to the uh, book section, the art section. I used to go to the art section a lot. I used to go through the art and photography section uh, a lot as a kid. I mean, even... Because I was looking for art books, and I was always looking for photography books to, to draw. Um, and uh, they had the book, uh, The Art of Patrick Nagal. I was like, oh, that's cool. Nice big, uh, it was a soft cover with a slip cover. I think they had a hardcover version of it too, but I remember the soft cover. And I started flipping through it, and of course this one had, you know, and I'm going to try to not show the nudity here. Not that I have any problem with that, I just don't want... YouTube to have a shit fit about it, so uh, I'm going to try to minimize the nudity. And his nudity is pretty tastefully done anyway. It's not over over the top. But um, he would it, he had a lot of the nude ones in there. I was like, whoa, you know, as a teenager, you're like, whoa, hey, what's he doing? And I noticed, I mean, I hyper-focused on little simple things. Like, I noticed how he did things. Now, it seems pretty straightforward. It almost like it's like comic book art. I mean, like old-school comic book art. It was, you know, line art. A lot, you know, a lot of the girls had black hair, which I liked a lot. You know, white, pale white skin, because it was just white. It wasn't a flesh tone. That was his style, with the white, with the jet black hair, and then he would do the white lines in the hair to denote, den you know, the flowing of the hair. Um, if you ever seen Jetta from Gem and the Holograms, I think that character was definitely inspired by Nagal. Um, but uh, you know, and comic book artists would do that technique. Uh, I, used, I use that technique for my comics a lot too. But 
you would think, okay, so he does a pen and art, pen and art, sorry, a pen and ink drawing, um, and then he would just put down, lay down simple color. Now, if he's doing is it a print like that, he probably isn't painting it. He was probably using like um, doing a screen tone, you know, screen printing, and then laying with some with the ink. I'm just assuming that's how he did it. I, I don't know for certain because it might even said in the book, and I don't know. However, I will know in just a few minutes <laughs> because I did get the book. I found it on a, it was a total fluke too. I was on thrift books. You know, I'm really starting to like thrift books, even though I kind of have a problem with their barcode thing. They have a lot of books that from the past that I either had or wanted. Um, and in this one I wanted. I never had this book. And it, uh, it um, what do you call it? Uh, they're relatively expensive. I think this was like 14 bucks and free shipping. Like tax, like 15 80 or something like that. I can't remember. I'll open it in just a minute. We'll do an un unbagging, boxing, whatever. Let me pull up, obviously, so you know who I'm talking about. Um, oops. This is probably his most iconic image, just because this is the cover of Rio. Uh, I think that's the cover of the book, too. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the cover of Rio, isn't it? The Duran Duran's Rio? I think so. If not, it's very similar to that. <laughs> I think that is, though. Uh, and as you can see, look at his art. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, but he likes to do this thing where he likes to put a shadow... Like if he's using the mauve there, that mauve shadow. <clears throat> Sorry, mauve's like a. I know I'm gonna use some art, artsy fartsy terms, but anyways, mauve is a uh, is like a grayish um, lavender or purple, um, and uh, he he does use a lot of lavenders. He does use a lot of magentas, like that whole dress piece that she has there is magenta, and he really likes these stark. Like he does these lines a lot. He doesn't always do them, but he'll do like these like almost like Bauhaus style um, design uh, little lines that go through there. And you would think he would just paint them on, but no, he actually draws them out over the drawing. I mean, within the drawing. And then you can see he, he follows to... So what he's doing is he's using shade to just make those lines look raised, almost like you do like with um, with logo types to make it look raised. And he'd do that a lot. So. Like he, said, like, he did it in the one strand of hair, which is weird that he didn't do it in all of them. He'd do it around the eyes where the makeup would be. These giant, you know, stiletto earrings. He, he made these, uh, he made that thing obviously under the chin to give that a raised look. Um, but he wouldn't get carried away. He'd do it very sparingly. And I believe, don't quote me on this, because he does do it on the outfit here, I see. But most of the time, most of his shading is really simple on the skin. Because he likes to do that all white skin, and I think he uses the color that's in that complements whatever the other colors are, like her her magenta dress. It's like the you know, like a flowing kind of piece to her dress there. Then he's got the earrings, um, and then the real bright red lips, really dark crimson lips like that. Um, and then it's got more of a, a lilac, if you will, <laughs> background there. Sorry, I'm going off of my uh, my color theory. You got lilac in the back, some magenta, some mauve. <laughs> I will use chartreuse sometime in this in this uh, video. So, and yes, I know what chartreuse is. So, I get a lot of women for some reason that are just flabbergasted that I I'm that I'm straight and that I know what the colors are called. It's just like I, I draw, you know, <laughs> and I've had multiple color sets, whether it's paint, ink, colored pencils, markers. They have names of of the colors, and a good way to remember what color you need is to remember the name. That doesn't seem like rocket science to me, but for some reason, I've talked to a lot of women in my day that are just flabbergasted. Like, how do you know all these all these colors and be straight? <laughs> Basic memorization? It's it's not really that difficult. I don't know. I'm I'm not. Per I never. I was it perplexed me that they were perplexed. Sorry. Um, but anyways, uh, so that's what his art looks like. Um, I'm going to pull up real quick. Let's just get a little bit of background, and then we'll open up the book. And I'll show you more images here. Let's pull up um, the Wikipedia on it. Um, he did die young, and I'm assuming... I used to know his a little bit more about him. I know he was friends with um, Keith Haring and... and, and um, 
all those all those whack wackadoodles they were all in, all friends with each other back in those days but um anyways uh he was born in Dayton, Ohio, 1945, uh, died at age 38, 1984. So this year would be the 40th anniversary of his death um, in Santa Monica, California. Of course he went to Santa Monica, California. Um, it, the artist died young, California. What do you think he died of? I mean, it's... <laughs> let's, just, let's, let's, let's take a wild guess. I'm going to look at death here. Nagal died... February 4th, 1984, after participating in a 15-minute celebrity aerobathon to raise funds for the... Oh, wait, is this where he, he goes to the car? I know there's a story about him in the car doing something, like he falls asleep in a car, he dies in the car, I don't know, let's see. But, um, 15-minute celebrity aerobathon, I don't know if you know what aerob aerobics, and this is the 80s, and this is California, and look at his art. So... <laughs> to raise funds for American Heart Association in Santa Monica. An autopsy determined his cause of death was heart attack. Well, obviously, it wasn't where I was going. I was thinking either drug overdose or um, suicide. That's what I was assuming. But uh, I, it doesn't look like he went. He didn't want to go. <laughs> Although, maybe if he knew his blood pressure was that high, maybe he should not be participating in a robothon. And a further autopsy revealed that Nagal, or Nagel, had a congenial heart defect that went undetected his entire life. Well, there you go. He was survived by his wife, straight. Not that that matters, but I'm just pointing that out. Jenna, Jennifer Damas, 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 sorry, <laughs> Damas, and his daughter from from a previous marriage, uh, Carol Nagel, Le, Levine, Levine, uh, against his parents' wishes and through no direct attribute, uh, attributable. No direction attributable to him. Patrick Nagal was cremated and his ashes scattered over the Pacific Ocean. I remember, there's a situation. I remember reading an article or something about him in a car. Like he fell asleep in a car or something and like missed uh, something. I thought maybe they're going to say he died in the car. Um, uh, let's see. Legacy captures the emotional state of the era, the 1980s American desire, collective materialism, aspiration, a less than zero state of mind. Um. <clears throat> said Alex Israel, whom Duran Duran hired to create the album art for their 2015 Paper Gods, huh? which visually referenced Nagal's famous Rio cover. Oh, okay. Create an album art for the 2015 release of Paper Gods. Uh, I, don't, I don't know much about Duran Duran. I'm, I like the Rio album. I mean, like, you know, her Rio and Relax and stuff like that, but I don't know a lot about them. Um, which visually references, okay. So maybe they used, re okay, so they probably used that piece of artwork that was, wasn't was commissioned, it was purchased, the rights to use it. They use it for Rio, and then they ended up commissioning him later to do something based on, okay, uh, that makes more sense. Art market. Uh, Nagal Prince flooded the market in the 1980s. There you go. Nagal's manager, Carl Bornstein, president of Mirage Editions, Inc., continued publication of Nagal's work after his death. It, well, it had to have, because I got it in the late 80s, including open edition prints and mass market posters. Bam! There you go. In addition, in 1991, the FBI discovered and dismantled a counterfeiting ring which flooded the market with forged serographs. While this contributed to Nagal's cultural ubiquity Nagal artwork was in a reported 2 million homes worldwide. It also served to exploit the brand and ultimately dramatically lowered its value. So, again, this is why you probably know this artist, but you don't, didn't know what his name was. Um, like I said, that many people buying posters and that much, that many posters flying on all the malls back in the 80s, I could, I, you definitely have seen it. I think He's probably more uh, of a cultural icon than, say, like Boris Vallejo. Because um, I did my Boris... It was back when I first started doing videos. Maybe that's what it was. But, yeah, nobody paid attention to my Boris video. Which is kind of a shame. Because he's one of my favorite artists of all time. But I'm sure if I did a Frank Frazetta one, I'm sure... Hopefully, he's going to get a little bit more notoriety. But, um... Uh, I, I'm not going to... I'm not... You can go and check all of the stuff out here. Uh, I was just curious of a couple of things. Oh, I just, let's just read the thing about Nagel women, though, real quick. The Nagal woman. 
1977, Nagal made his first poster image for Mirage Editions, with whom he printed many images, his most famous being those of Nagal women. The Nagal woman was developed over time and increased in popularity after Nagal began publishing his own work with Playboy in 1975. Women were drawn as Nagal's ideal women. His female figure tended to have black hair, bright white skin. Nagal worked with many models, including Playboy Playmates Kathy St. George, Tracy Vassaro, Shannon Tweed, and also painted several celebrity portraits, including those of Joan Collins and Joan Ca Joanna Cassidy. Uh, there has been much discussion about the inspiration of Nagal's style, since little is known about Nagal's art background. There's no definite answer to this. Okay, this is interesting. Let's read this. Like some of the old printmasters, Toulouse-Lautrec and Bernard, for example, Nagal was influenced by the Japanese woodblock prints. Totally see that. Um, I think I knew that. I, I don't know why it was such a revelation to me now, but with... With figures silhouetted against a neutral background with strong areas of black and white and with bold lines and unusual angles of view, he handled colors with rare originality and freedom. He forced perspective from flat two-dimensional images and he kept simplifying, working to convey more with fewer elements. Okay, I'll put a pin in that. His simple and precise imagery is also reminiscent of the Art Deco style of the 1920s and the 1930s. Its sharp linear treatment, geometric simplicity, and stylization of form yield images that are formal yet decorative, according to Ilana G. Milley, curator of the poster collection at the Library of Congress. Art historians have speculated that he may have been influenced by Japanese style art, yes, but there's no specific evidence for that. His map making experiences in Vietnam possibly did more to steer him into high contrast imagery than anything else. So that's interesting. No, I think I did know that. I think he knew he was he was a map maker in in, in Nam. Nam. Um, but uh, that's weird though. Yeah, so he made it. Well, I guess you're drafted in Vietnam back then. I guess unless you. You know, if you knew he had a heart condition, he might as well said something if he knew about it to get himself out of going. But um, it's funny, a lot of the, my favorite artists who actually had to serve, um, they, uh, you know, like Jack Kirby, of course, you know, all those guys from Marvel served over in, uh, in World War II. But Kirby, specifically, Kirby became a map maker as well. Um, it just seemed like if you were an artist in the... You know, and you were in the military, especially against your will, because you'd rather be doing art. Um, they would you, they would identify that skill right off the bat, or you would tell them, and then they would, uh, you know, put you into, uh, you know, put you into map making. It seems like map making was the big thing. Um, I was in the army very briefly. I got out early, uh, and while I was there, um, they I was drawing. I was because I was bored, and I had nothing. Couldn't bring any contraband. With so I would draw my own. I was drawing a lot of ladies, drawing a lot of uh, ladies to you know to impress people in the platoon, and a lot of people wanted me to draw ladies for them. Um, and uh, you know they, they said, "Oh, you can draw really well." Um, and then I remember they get mad because I was drawing ladies all the time. Like oh, you know you can't you can't be drawing all these ladies for these guys. It's just like why not? <laughs> some of them were giving me money. No, not a lot, but I mean some guys like hey you know here I'll give you. A, uh, you know, here's five bucks, here's ten bucks, you know, just whip me out of draw, you know, hot drawing of a girl with big boobs, you know, uh, you know, a big butt. And then, uh, you know, I didn't do a lot of that, but I did a decent amount. I wasn't in the army for very long, but anyways, they wanted me to, I had to paint the whole Mad Dogs was the name of our, uh, our platoon were the Mad Dogs. And, uh, he wanted, somebody had painted a really bad, like really, looked like, I mean, it was like horrendously bad mural on the wall inside the barracks of the Mad Dogs. Um, and then he wanted me to, he says, hey, can you do a better job than that? And I go, oh yeah. Um, so I drew out on paper and I remember a lieutenant wanting to see it. Let me see that before if you guys do it. I want to see if it's any good. And uh, I drew a, the like a bulldog, kind of you know, like a pit bull looking character. You know, big beefy guy with an army uniform on. Really stupid. I mean, it's the type of shit that 
people in the army would like, or like, you know, people like tattoos. Like, I wanna, I want Gene Simmons, and I want him in a in a fire fire firefighter outfit because I, I I'm a firefighter, and they did a song called Fire. It's just stupid shit like that. Um, so put a big bulldog guy in a in a in an army uniform. <laughs> Woo! I didn't see that one coming. Uh, but I did that, and then I had to I had to recruit a bunch of guys that said that they knew how to could help, and then we ended up finished painting that mural and that. So if you go to that platoon, or if you go to the Ma the Mad Dog Second Platoon, I don't know if it's the same anymore on Fort Benning, Second Platoon Infantry, uh, the Mad Dogs, because there's House of Pain was down the street, and we were the Mad Dogs. If you go to the Mad Dogs, um, I think first or first sorry second company first, second company were third platoon uh, building and they probably moved that around the building went in and be there anymore but um, and you were there and you saw that big painting on the wall I did that um, I mean I had to help people help me paint it but I drew it out and then they helped me paint it um, so yeah it's just funny I, a lot of these artists that also served in the military ended up doing the same thing um, as if you're an artist you clearly can't stop if whatever you do, I mean, to me it's drawing, and you just can't stop drawing, so, you know, might as well do something constructive with it, and me, I'm, you know, it's taken me this long in my life to finally get around to it, but I'm, you know, now making a living at it, so, um, but, uh, yeah, like I said, so, the artists like Nagal here, I'm, I, I like girl art, um, and, uh, you know, I love girl art from, like, I love, like, pulp, pulp mag, you know, pulp girl art, stuff like that, you know, in speaking of military, even like the cool mascots, like the Vargas stuff that they were using for, uh, you know, they they were like basically ripping off Vargas postcards on the uh, bombers and the planes back in um, World War II. Um, and I think that stuff's really that's when they were doing. Some of those guys knew what the hell they were doing. They weren't drawing stupid shit. I mean, there were some stupid ones, but most of the time it was just some hot check on the side of a plane. It's just like they knew what they were doing. Um, person who and the people who wanted me to do stuff when I was in the army in the in the 90s uh, they were not smart anyways uh, well let's see going back here so yeah so let, like I said go ahead and read this about him um, I kind of given you his background and stuff so again let's pull up his uh, his work here so I'm gonna let me go to a full screen out we'll open the book let me check through the book just to make sure there's nothing, you know, that's going to get me in trouble on the thing. And I'll show you a few pages. I'll show you what the inside looks like. And then I've got some, some pieces that are, you know, safe for work that I've put in the folder that we can check out too as well. So let me, uh, let me go back to full screen here. Rip this bad boy open. I said, I have not had this in hand since... I might have saw it in the 90s, too. Like, when we had a Barnes & Noble, open, our first Barnes & Noble in Rochester open up over there, when they built that Target shopping center. This would probably be, like, my junior year of high school. Um, they had a lot of cool art books. I remember seeing the Necronomicon there, the Giger stuff. They had some Boris books there and everything, and I believe they had this book. Why am I? I'm sorry. Um, I believe they had this book. And that's probably the last time I literally saw it in hand. So far, so good. Not, yeah, that's it. Got a little bit of a smoosh on the bottom here, which I can live with. Um, I'm going to pull off that, pull it off now since I probably get off. Pull off that stupid uh, thrift book sticker, which I wish they would not put on these. Um, there it is. That is the book. That is the book. How much was this thing? It's twenty bucks, nineteen ninety-five retail. When was the copyright on it? That's what I'm questioning. Nineteen eighty-five. Yep. So I probably saw it. Uh, I probably not nineteen eighty. Well, you know, it might have been nineteen eighty-five or thereabouts because, um, and it, you know, what? it might not be. I know I did see it at at the lakeside. Walden Books, but you know what, I think it was actually at the Walden Books in the Great Oaks Mall, because I was going in there to pick up comics a lot. Um, so this been 85, I was in 7th grade, as Mr. Brooks' art class, and I remember he telling me, he's like, you know, you should really draw from real life, he says, but, you know, compiling, like, 
books on uh, photography is always a good idea too, just to learn, you know, composition. And he says, and getting books on your on other artists is always good just to look at study other artists. You know, I was just I was just basically got this is the first time anybody outside of Mr. Uh, Teller in elementary school telling me, you know, what you need, what you should be doing to continue your art education. And uh, that makes sense because I was I was riding up to Rochester Book Center and going to Walden Books looking for comics, and I was I remember specifically getting those Marvel universes at the time. And I, I wandered over, asked the girl at the counter, hey, do you have art books? Oh, yeah, there's a such and such. And then walked over there, and it was like with the photography books. Um, a lot of photography books on, on taking pictures of nude women, too, which I was like <laughs> sneaking to look. And as soon as I saw the girl come, I was like, oh, no, 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 put it back on the shelf. <laughs> but, you know, at 12 years old, my son's age, too. But um, i pretty sure, you know, if this came out in 85, I'm sure this was on the shelf. And I did see it. Um, you know, I don't. I, I don't even remember seeing what the guy looked like. There's a picture of him right there. Um, and obviously, this is published before his death in '84. I mean, after his death in '84. Um, yeah, there's some topless. A lot of it, most of the nudity is just top. He, and it's funny because he draws the nipples like a specific way, which is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I love the way he does boo. I mean, clothing. He's, I like I said, very, very much inspired me to uh, draw. I mean, here's a pencil sketch. This is a dude, too. Here's a pencil sketch. So, I mean, we shouldn't be looking at the... Rush <laughs> is eating a popsicle. Eating a thing. There's a pencil sketch. And that's what I like to see. I really love to see that type of stuff. Um, real nice, clean, perfect pencil sketch. Um... Yeah, nice stuff. I mean, he, he, was, he could have easily have been an outstanding comic book artist. Um, see, a lot of... Looks like uh, some interviews in here. Joan Collins has a bit she talks about. And Hugh Hefner talk has a bit he says something. Uh, yeah, I noticed, like I said, I'm not going to show it, but I noticed that he... To, to draw nipples is, is weird. I mean, guys or, or women... Draw nipples is weird. If you want to give it like that rough kind of like uh, you know texture, wrinkly feel to it, what he did, and it's interesting that I picked up on this as a kid, is what he would do is he would he made his nipples perfectly symmetrical. So he used a, an ellipse template, um, and then he would use the underline. It would literally draw the nipple like um, literal. As in, like, you wouldn't draw it from life. He was making this stuff up. He would draw the nipple, draw the, the areoli, and then he would take what looks like a, uh, uh, not a Conti crayon, but like a, a colored pencil wax art stick. And he must have, I don't know what kind of paper he was using, because a lot of his paper lines look very uh, sharp and very clean. He had to have been getting that texture somehow, almost like drawing and taking like a, like a, Mr. Dodson, my art teacher in high school, he told us to put a piece of paper against the cinder blocks and then draw, and you get the, like, you know, use it to rub it, to get like a rubbing of it. So he was doing something like that on that. I, I picked that up as a kid. It was one of the first things I zeroed in on, you know, as a kid. And I was just like, oh, is that, oh, what's that? I, that's cool. Um, I mean, he's got Mirage Galleries, I think was the, like it was saying, talking about Mirage Galleries. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of it, it's like I said, you've, you've, you've seen his art before, but you probably just didn't know who he was. And this book's awesome. I love this book. I'm so glad I finally, I mean, I, I, I wanted this forever and never got it. And I finally got it for cheap. Well, relatively cheap. Five dollars less than I would have had to pay for it at the uh, bookstore back in 1985. Um, actually, 20 bucks back then. That's why, probably why I didn't buy it, even though I had... Tell any of the things I spent 20 bucks on, or maybe buying a book. Also, it's funny, because it also creeped me out looking through this, too, because, you know, you're a kid, and you're like, are they going to let me buy this? Should, are they going to yell at me for being in the section looking at all these art books with all these naked ladies in it? It's like, and I, it's like, you know, it's like watching Glow. You know, it's just like, I felt like I was, you know, I had nudie magazines, you know, I was looking at that stuff. So it was, 
I, you know, that's probably another reason why I kind of hesitated to actually buy it. Okay, so serograph. I don't know what a serograph is. I should look that up. I've never heard of that. I know what a. Um, I like to get the heck's it called. Uh, there was a there was a printmaking. Mrs. Weaver had to do a printmaking series with uh, photo emulsion. Um, I don't, I don't think that's what this is, but um, I have to look up what a serograph is. But he does. I know it was a printing system to do his prints. He would layer them up just like you do a normal print, screen print, um, to get that up. I mean, I, I, I said it was they were the prints. They weren't. It wasn't like he was hand coloring these, and you know, in order to get these printed, he would probably print them himself. Most likely, I like that one a lot. Nice one. Let me throw, throw some animals in it. I guess you can, I guess I can get pretty good stuff. I mean, this one's not nudity, but I mean, it's, it's suggestive. It's risque. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, nice. I like that one. I can't show that one. That's a nice one. I like, I really, I've always liked that one. I, in, it, here's the thing I liked about this one. I'm going to cover up the, the naughty bits. Is, the feet is his, like they're talking about, his foreshortening, getting the foreshortening down. I mean, it's simple stuff that I do nowadays, but back then when I was a young kid, it was just like I was picking up, it's like, how do you do that where you make the one leg look like it's receding back in space? Well, that's foreshortening. You know, obviously comic book artists do it all the time. But, you know, just building this vocabulary of, of how to do this stuff in Watching, you know, looking at all this stuff at a young age was so formidable. I, again, I love the, I love pencil sketches. I love seeing the pencils. I mean, I love when I draw stuff, and it's like in between the different phases of being finished. And it's, I usually set, I for my own benefit, I'll save versions of it because I like to look at that part. Um, and uh, you know, I find that very satisfying. I mean, I like the finished piece, but I mean, I like the, I like the, the, all the think lines. I like all the thinking and all of the stuff on how it was, how it goes in. I mean, some of these are, I mean, they're, like I said, he would have been an amazing comic book artist. Um, and you know, it's funny, I've seen comic book art that looks indicative of this. I I know there's no question in my mind that there's a lot of comic book artists out there, professionals that have looked at, uh, you know, that we're big fans of Nagal or Nagel. Um, it's, it's, it's nudity, but I mean, like, he didn't even draw, draw. it's a side boob, and he didn't even draw in the nipple, so it's, you can't hear, I'll, I'll put my thumb over it, there we go, it's censored. Um, that's a great one, I like that one a lot. I love the hair, love the hair. You know, it's funny, He's he would do one of two things. He'd either do the girl looking that way, or looking away, looking off camera, or he'd do the girl looking at the camera. You know, a lot of times in photography, they you know, have, have the model look directly at the camera. So it's like, you know, the, it's, it makes a connection with the viewer. Um, but a more dramatic way, obviously. And what's really cool is draw a model, or draw a character, not only is looking away, but has no... You can't see it's her irises, you know, or pupils. All you can see is Shalaria, just straight Shalaria. So it looks all white, almost like Storm when she's using her powers. Um, oh, great one. That's a great drawing. And I love having the, uh, the pencil sketch, too. Love having that. Here's a serograph again. Serograph progressive set. Uh, I'm not looking... I'm sure nobody uses serographs anymore. I'm just I'm curious to see what the uh, the thought process is. I loved it. I I need to. I need some time. If I've had some time <laughs> to do my own artwork, and that always happened to be on the grind, cranking my artwork out, I would definitely. You know, I, I, I should have done this before. I would def definitely like to do. I'm not gonna say copy him, but definitely do some uh, some girl art. Just how he does it, but just um, you know, I'm not gonna. I don't want to copy his style exactly, 
which is stuff indicative of that style. That's cool. And then he shows how he does the uh, how he does like those lines and like so those are those lines that I was always talking about. Sometimes as we go behind the figure, sometimes they, they over you know they cover the figure. I think people would see that's a pretty famous one. That is not the cover, by the way. I remember the cover now. It's not the, the Rio print. It's that cover. Um, love that one. Absolutely love that one. Oh, man, it's pencil sketches. Love this one. I love ones from the back, obviously. One of my favorites. There's the Rio. Here's Rio. So I guess I don't really need to pull these up on here. Oh, you, wait, I saw that when I, when I put on the screen there, but... There was a uh, Duran Duran album cover. Acrylic on glass. It's called Rio. Maybe that was commissioned. I, I don't know. It must have been. Uh, love that one. You, you know these girls always kind of remind me of? Is, uh... Gozer the Gazarian <laughs> from, I mean, it's 1984, you know, Gozer the Gazarian, a short jet black hair with like, like an updo kind of short hair, kind of a, like a waterfally kind of hair with the all white skin. It's very Gozer the Gazarian. I mean, that's why I also had a thing for Gozer the Gazarian. I always thought she was pretty hot. Um, and then, uh, it's funny that Olivia, what's her face? Is Olivia Moon? Is that her name? later in the, uh, that newer one. I won't show this one, but there's the same technique he does on the nipples again. I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to do some... I, there's a lot of nipples that I do in my... Not as many nipples as you'd think, but I do a lot of nipples. And uh, I'm always, always looking for a new, a new, more aesthetically cool way to, to do that. Uh, and I've tried many different, many different techniques. None of them I really feel that perfect or that you know looked really that good oh, it's, you gotta put some Asian stuff in there you gotta have some some 80s or 80s quasi Asian samurai or, uh, you know, like my shirt my uh, my what do you call it my rising sun shirt <laughs> um, I do gotta say though not all of them but there are a lot of women it's Playboy too, so Playboy really loves their pancake butts. <laughs> I really do not like pancake butts at all. Uh, I like squatted modern TikTok butts is what I like. And the thing is, but it makes sense, it's Playboy. Playboy, obviously, it's always about the boobs of Playboy. Playboy was very anti-butt in their magazine. Um, and when they, they usually pick models that yeah had just literally like no hips, flat pancake butt, but had giant fake, you know, fake boobs, uh, usually blonde, although none of these girls are blonde, they're all black hair, which I, I really, I really like the face on that one. Yeah, it's, that was the other thing, is the faces, too, are so sharp, and so, um, just striking. It's funny, it's like the, the makeup, what's that new makeup the girls do on their eyes now with the little, I, I really don't like it. The reason I don't like it is because they don't do it with the rest of the 80s aesthetic. They do it with a more modern, you know, hot topic -y, gothy -y aesthetic where they do the uh, the Egyptian eye thing now. Um, he was doing it all the time in that stuff. But the thing was with the, all the colors, this 80s colors and the 80s aesthetic um, looked, uh, I find it looks better. It was a classic one. That, you know, that, that almost looks like Gustav Klimt. That's another artist I really like. It's Gustav Klimt. Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele. Um, I gotta, I mean, maybe I should, I, I think I said in another video that I really don't like fine art. And for the most part, I don't. I know not a lot. I mean, I've taken my art history classes in college and, you know, I've studied art and, you know, art history somewhat. You know, it's the whole story. I, went, I think I went off about the Camille Claudel and my uh, and Katz's uh, figure drawing class back at OCC. But um, 
I did in the '90s. I did kind of go into my own. I, I didn't. I did it on my, after I quit school for the first time. I kind of went on my own and started studying art history. Uh, I remember going to the library a lot and checking out books on art history, going to the bookstores, looking at like going to the DIA a lot, going to the uh, the uh, art art uh, you know the, the art art museum. <laughs> Sorry. Down in, uh, there's one in Toledo I went to. I think I've gone to the one in, I've gone to two of them out near DC. Oh, I've gone to one in DC, gone to a Smithsonian. I've gone to a lot of art, art ones. I gotta say, I mean, I like that experience, but at the same time, there's just so little art that really catches my eye. And, um, and the thing is, I guess more of the stuff that catches my eye is illust illustrated art, illustration, a commercial illustration art, like this. Or like, um, you know, like Norman Rockwell uh, art that's um, that's commercially it's for for commercial use. It's, you know, a lot of advertising art. I love advertising art. I love it. There's so much advertising art, like mid-century modern advertising art that's just so nice to look at. I mean, it's just I can sit there and look at that stuff for hours. Um, and then of course that plays into like you know um, Alex Toth. And his art and his uh, design work he did, you know, with Hanna Barbera, and uh, you know, that kind of like, you know, mid-century modern atomic age kind of, uh, you know, Cold War era '50s style, '60s style um, art. I love that stuff. But as far as like actual like hardcore fine artists, very few that I like. I like Luke Gustav Klimt. I love his stuff. Uh, I like. Um, I'm not a big Rembrandt person. Um, I like pretty much the guys that would do girl art, um, and Klimt is obviously one of those guys, uh, Achille was one of those guys, although Achille's stuff's a little too, uh, sometimes it's off-putting to look at it, like he does, he does really weird styles with some of the women, and the end dudes, and he makes them all weird looking, and I was just like, ah, um, but, uh, you know, Nagal, I guess, would be more of like pop, pop art, um. Because obviously, you know, it got really popular. So he was like more of a pop modern artist. Now, modern art, like, you know, like Warhol stuff, can't stand it. Um, a lot of that stuff where it's just like, you know, modern art, it's just the stuff you go like, I can't believe somebody paid money for this. You know, I could do that. My, yeah, that type of stuff I'm not a big fan of. But like abstract stuff. I like figure drawing. And that's primarily my favorite thing is figure drawing. And to some degree, I like some automotive drawing, you know, and some product, you know, uh, technical drawing. And then a comic, obviously comic stuff you'd use in doing comic books. But, um, we got to the end of the book. Okay, so they have all the prints all numbered here and all the names. Um, just some awesome stuff. I mean, seriously awesome stuff. Very inspiring, too. I mean, really, really pushes my buttons when it comes to... Uh, not all of these are in this book. But they do have them all. They talk about the original size. So let's look at some of the original sizes and so on. So 24 by 34. Uh, 22, 23 by 33. It looks like he's using some standard sizes. 24 by 36 is a standard size. Um... 24 by 32 is the standard size. Uh, the 23 by 33 and three quarters is that oddball standard size I don't like. Um, I think that poster up there, the, the Kiss one, it's in a 24 by 36 frame because that's all I had at the time. But this, it's a, uh, I believe it's a 23 by 33 and a half. It's a standard size, but it's a, it's an oddball one. I'm not a big fan of it. I like like the, the common ones. 18 by 24, 11 by 14, or less, sorry, uh, yeah, 11 by 14, 9 by 11, um, 24 by 36, uh, what's the big, real big one, I can't remember what it is, something by 40, some 42, 42 or 44, um, not that many people go that big, uh, but <clears throat> a 24 by <coughs> post size is cool. Yeah, like I said, a lot of the stuff was for commercial art and was used for posters. So, of course, he's going to do it in the same dimensions as the poster. 
Um, and then a lot of times he would, when he doesn't, you know, when he doesn't do the image in the perfect size, then they could use that, they could make a border on it and then put some, uh, some graphics on it to, uh, to bat it into that size too. That's kind of cool. But, uh, which is also interesting too. And then he looks like he would play with that too. He would move, uh, you know, he'd, he'd make stuff look more cinematic and more dynamic looking like that. That's pretty cool. I mean, the cover itself is that simple thing. So it's an odd size, probably. I haven't measured it. It's an odd size drawing, but you want you want to fit it to this book. I think this is eleven. Do by nine by. It's bigger nine by twelve. It's like nine by thirteen. It's a weird size book. Um, but uh, yeah, he would do that, and then you could bat it in. You could just play with the margins because pretty much all of this is margin. So. I guess I don't really, I guess, well, here, I'll, I'll pull up what I found. I, I think some of the ones we've already seen in the book. Um, and, of course, I I put I put the not safe for work ones in a special folder, so we don't have to pull those ones up. But, uh, and all these are not very big either. I got this in, like, a bundle. Like, somebody had a, a folder. I just downloaded the folder, and it was a bundle of stuff. So they're not all perfectly, so actually, let's, we can blow them up. I already had one up, I guess. So, this is, so look at that too. So, also, that's so cool. Like that, I would, I would do that a lot with like my hands and stuff. Like when you're drawing hands doing something, I'd always do that. I always kind of do that. Almost like, you know, you know, there's the Vulcan, here's a, a what's his face, long shot fingers. Um, I would do that a lot, and I noticed that he'd do that, and I just picked up on that. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, we definitely started thinking alike. Um, so that's very striking. Uh, I like the sunglasses on there. See how the foreshortening of the sunglasses looks perfect. And then you do this cast. It just takes, it doesn't take a lot. Like, when my artwork, when I shade things, people think, like, oh, my, he must have labored for hours on this. Like, no, I didn't, actually. I, I'll make you think I did. But the thing is, a lot of it's just like, just simple, adding a simple shadow. You would not believe how much it makes something pop three-dimensionally just by adding a simple shadow in the right spot. Um, and you would think, you know, you labored on it for hours. It's like, no, it's just a simple, hard cut. Um, great one. I love the, I love the big, uh, I love those big... Uh, baggy sweaters with the shoulder open and then wearing that over like the leotard it's very that i love the aerobics look i love that 80s jazzercise aerobics fashion look i love that look um yes i've seen that video the uh the call on me video <laughs> i've seen that i like it a lot um yeah there's the real one again of course Love the short hair. Hey, not a lot of uh, flowers or plants and stuff, but this one, you didn't draw the plants. You just did the shadow of the plant. It's got a very, you know, West Coast vibe to it, which is also very 80s, that West Coast look. Um, you know, it's the 80s, so that's when the big shoulder pads started to come out, but the power suits. That's who these, these women, they, it's like they're, mo they're models, but they also, they have, they get, they feel like, like the, it's like modern woman, you know what I mean? Modern woman with her modern clothes. And that's, the thing I love about She-Hulk, when John Byrne did She-Hulk, is he put She-Hulk in a lot of these clothes and kind of gave her that 80s thing, but, you know, I love that. I just love the time period. Uh, this also makes me think of, and I don't think they had Nagal prints specifically, but I remember going to Pier 1 a lot, Pier 1 Imports, with my sister a lot, and looking for the futon, the wicker furniture, and the paper paper lamp bulbs and stuff, going to, uh, that, that, it's funny, the Pier 1 Imports downtown Rochester, it's now Turaloo's, which is a bar, they have good pizza, it's like my sister's favorite, when my sister rolls into town, we're going to do Turaloo's, so we always go to Tur Turaloo's, but every time we go to Tourlouz, I just keep thinking we're going to Pier 1 Imports, because that used to be the Pier 1 Imports. It's funny. Um, 
Yeah, and I, like I said, there's downtown Rochester. Here I go again. Downtown Rochester used to be cool. They had, they had, they had an art store, the Green's Art Supply. They had the Varsity Shop. Not that I was huge into that, but you could get Chuck Taylor's cheap there. Um, you can get you know you can get the jerseys and stuff there. They had the drafting store where I'd go get my drafting supplies because the green stuff had a limited amount of drafting supplies, but they were a little too expensive. The place across the street had better, um, had more selection of like templates and stuff, and they're cheaper. And I used to buy a lot of that stuff. Um, ride my bike down there, buy it all up. Anyways, and then uh, we used to have. You know, I'm, I'm talking about this specific time period, like 85. The DNC was still there. Um, again, that software company had opened up inside that little mini mall, the Main Street Plaza, after the Hills Theater closed. And then they had that kind of like very 80s, you know, get your Garfield and Felix the Cat and your lips phones from that like phone store there. It was very 80s. And then there was a post, there was a, well, there's Fabulous Galleries, which is the place that I used to work with uh, Tom. The guy on the place. It's gone now. But I worked at Fab. I went to used to go to Fabulous Galleries a lot as a kid and then ended up working for him for about a year, eh, less than a year. And me and him just, we just didn't see eye to eye. Um, I, I, I work for two framers now. One in this town, too, downtown here, the Golden Gallery. Worked for framers twice in my life. And I seem to butt heads pretty hard with the, fr the owners. Um, it's their store, so obviously they're employing me do a job but I butt headed butt heads twice with them and we've always gotten arguments and the reason I ended up quitting was just because we didn't see the eye to eye on stuff you know in the first case at Fabulous Galleries he's an older guy than me and he knows his shit but at the same time as I have I have a lot of ideas that I feel like weren't you know being an artist myself you know, studying it pretty much my most of my entire life. You know, even by that age, I think it was 26 when I worked there, I uh, had a pretty good idea of what I thought, like, especially, like, hanging the gallery and stuff like that. And he didn't want to hang the gallery. It's like he, every time, he would only do things if it was his idea. Every time I had an idea, he would never, he would always, he would always just brush up every idea I had. And we'd always do it his way. It's his store, so he wants to do it his way. I can't work with people like that. You know, it's my toys. You play with my toys my way. You know, I don't like that. Um, you hired me, and you, the thing is, I don't care if you say, hey, you know what, we're not going to do anything you want to do. You're just going to work for me, so shut up and just do your job, right? That's fine. But the problem is, and I hate, people do this to me all the time. They ask me, hey, they want my opinion on something, right? When my opinion doesn't match up with what they already have, this preconceived idea they have in their head, they always dismiss it, right? Why did you ask me if you weren't going to listen to me in the first place? If you, why didn't you tell me what you wanted, and then I'll agree with you if I think that that's a good idea or not, right? That should be your, the question. Is I've got this idea that I'm going to do no regardless of whatever you say, and I don't even know why I'm asking you for your opinion, but what's your call on it? Yeah, I think it's stupid. All right, well, I'm doing it anyways, right? Then why did you ask me, right? Are they asking, well, what are your thoughts on it? What are your ideas on it? Here are my thoughts, my ideas. Well, I don't like those thoughts and ideas. Then why did you ask me? You knew, you should know me by now that this, that I'm going to give you some question, some answer that's relatively in the ballpark of what the answer I give you. So why do you keep asking me for my opinion? And the same, exact same situation happened in many years later when I first rolled into Bay City and I needed a job quick and I got a job down there and the exact same thing, right? It's just like, I'm done. You know, I can't. I can't work for people like that. It's just funny how they're both very similar businesses, almost the same business, and they both had the same type of people, and both had the same kind of falling out. Um, you know, and it's just like once this, once the relation, once I realize the person's like that, it's just like I. It's only my days are numbered <laughs> because I'm ready to go, and if I don't just walk out the door at that specific time. Call me a Ponzi hairdresser or whatever, you know, a hand waver. But, you know, like I said, I just can't work with people. Who ask me for my opinion on something and then never, never take, never, uh, you know, always hate my opinion. After, I would stop asking somebody their opinion if you don't like any of the opinions they give you. So, that said, um, where was I at?
whatever. So, I was talking about downtown access because I went off on a tangent there. All right, let me end it up because we're hitting that. We're coming up on an hour right now. So, again, this came up as a fluke. <clears throat> Wasn't planning on buying it, but when I saw it, it popped up. I was like, oh, wow, there's that Nagal book. How much is that? $14 and some odd cents. I looked inside and says it says it was in good condition. Just all it has is that little bump, which is not really that much of, big of a deal. Um... I always thought this was a slip cover. Why does this open up if there's nothing on the inside? Just to make it look cool, I guess? Back covers? Same thing. I don't know. It's weird. It seems like they're, uh, maybe just to make the cover have a certain feel to it. Whatever. But, again, an art book. Like I said, I, I don't have all the art books that I had as a, as a kid or even as a young adult. But I'm trying to put them all back together. Some of them are really hard to find. Like, Roger Dean's Views is really... I've got, I almost bought it, they wanted like 50 bucks for it in a, in a acceptable condition on thrift books. I'm like, nah. <laughs> a Rodney Matthews book, um, like I said, I got one Boris book. I like, they just didn't have a lot of the ones that I want. The Frazetta books I've seen cheap before. I, I've not, I had them before. I don't, I'm not in a big hurry to get the Frazetta ones again. But there's certain ones like this one. I never had this. Always wanted this, so now I've got it in the collection. And I would love to have some, some Nagal posters. Um, you know, it would really look 80s <laughs> in here if I threw some Nagal posters up. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, this is a book I always wanted. I said, Roger Dean's Views I still would like to have back. I had it. It's funny, I bought it. I'll tell the story real quick before I go. Um, I was down at Time Travelers, which is a comic book shop. Michael Golden owns the place. And I got 5,000 of those! I don't know if you know who Michael Golden is. If you've been to Time Travelers and in uh, Berkeley, Michigan, but um, he's this guy's he's got a very distinct voice. You can hear him all the way across the store. He loves to, he's a guy like my former boss bosses. I could see butting heads with this guy. He's very opinionated and he's very loud and he's very tall and he's very uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I've never really I've only had one bad instance with this guy. Once, when I was very, when I was still in high school, um, I, I, I guess I, uh, maybe I should tell the story. I guess it's I don't know. It doesn't really have anything to do with Nagal, but um, I uh, I had bought a bunch of superpowers action figures from him, and then I realized ah, I think I'm going to dump them all. So I went to go sell them all back, and uh, I took them all in there. And I'm a kid, so I don't know the rules of the world. I'm not a business owner. I don't know. The, like I said, don't know the rules of the world. But there's a kid in there. He was like, oh, can I, I'll buy that green arrow off you. Here, here's some money. He gave me the money for the green arrow. And I said, oh, sure. Right? And then he he just comes up to me. You know, he's like nine feet tall, too. He came up to me, you know, kind of like, not really shook me, but just kind of like, you know, he put his hands on, like, my shoulder or whatever. And he says, he's, 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 take your goddamn toys and get the hell out of my store. And I was just like, okay, what I do? And so I, I, I was out there sitting in the car. I had friends with me and they were still in the store. And they were kind of like, what, what? And I, I went I'm sitting in the car. I'm just like, all right, whatever. Um, and then they came back in and they said, uh, he, they said he, he's, he said he'd apologize. Go on, you, you can go back in. He'll buy your buy the figures off you. He said he'd apologize. But it really kind of hit me, you know, as a young kid. I think it was only like in, I think it was 11th grade or whatever. And, you know, I was a young kid and it just kind of hit me. Um, and so ever since that incident, I've always not liked him. Um, and again, and then just, I, well, more I used to go to his store and I used to hear his voice. And I used to hear other, like when I used to go to Tour Tour Tuesday, all the guys down at Comics Cafe and listen to those guys just go off about him and do their impressions. I got 5,000 of those! You know, that, that crazy voice. Um, anyways, I was there in high school. Uh, and uh, he's a, uh, and I'm walking by, like, he has, like, a new shelf thing with, like, new graphic novels and stuff on it. And there's Roger Dean's views. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And, I, and, like, it wasn't marked on the price. And I, I, I took the thing up to, I actually didn't go up to him. I went up to his brother that also worked there. His brother was a lot easier to talk to. Um, and I said to him, I said, how much is this? And he goes, it's not marked. <laughs> no kidding, genius. He's like, uh, he's like, I don't know, 
uh, 15 bucks. Okay. Gave him 15 bucks, walked away with Roger Dean's views. Now that was like in 1980, 1990, 91, 90, 91, somewhere around there. Um, and uh, it, uh, now you can't touch. Everybody's got it for like like Amazon. They want like over a hundred dollars for it. So it's like, oh come on, it's just a freaking book, right? But uh, you know, and Roger Dean, obviously, well, much like Nagal, he's a commercial artist, and obviously he does all the Yes album covers and a lot of the prog rock album covers. And uh, I had the book, and then I ended up selling it off for some needed money, and uh, I'd like to have it back. So. If you see Roger Dean's views for a decent price, either A, send me a link, or buy it, <laughs> and then uh, hopefully you wouldn't want to charge me a million dollars for, for, if you buy it for a decent price, like I'll pay like 20 bucks for it, 25 bucks for it, and I'll even pay like five, six bucks for shipping, right? But I'm not paying like 45 for it before shipping, definitely not paying over a hundred dollars for it. But, um, or if you see the link, just send me the link and say, hey, there it is. It's on sale for this price. You can get it. Boom. I still have it in my, in case one comes along. But like I said, I, thrift books is weird. It's like some books, I mean, you know, come along. They're like, going, okay, that seems like a steal. And then some books come along. And it's like they're literally charging like, like, you know, collector prices for it. It's like, are you a, is thrift books like a retail, like just use bookstore? Or are you more like a collector store? I, I don't know. kind of weird but anyways sorry I'll let you go here remember like and subscribe hope you like the Nagal stuff you got any questions about Nagal or you know more about him than I do let me enlighten me otherwise like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one all right bye, -bye.